the uh, the sentence uh, uh, beginning with the word uh, beginning with the uh, the moral of the history, and uh, uh, I take it that uh, that's one. This is one of the uh, key takeaways. Uh, you know, since the uh, title of the essay is called The Moral of History. And mm -hmm. she goes on to say that the moral of the history of the 19th century is the fact that men who were not ready to assume a responsible role in public affairs in the end were turned into mere beasts who could be used for anything before being led to slaughter. I'm not sure uh, who, uh, who she's talking about. Uh, uh, you're talking about the uh, 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 those who uh, uh, went to uh, Africa to uh, to exploit its resources, uh, Cecil Rhodes and the uh, uh, that whole uh, 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 excess and and, and uh, exploitation of the uh, uh, of the country uh, that. Uh, Goes under the phrase of uh, this economic imperialism uh, uh, of the bourgeoisie, uh, or is she uh, uh, talking about the uh, lack of uh, political uh, uh, involvement on the part of the Jews? Okay, uh, in the 19th, uh, it, even in the 19th century, uh, uh, before being led to the slaughter, which took took place. Uh, if, uh, uh, 50 years later, uh, after the age of uh, imperialism, which she dates from uh, uh, 1880 to, uh, to 1914. So uh, uh, I was wondering what uh, what the reaction of the group was to uh, that line, and and uh, who you thought of, or who, you know, who, who is she talking about here? She doesn't uh, amplify that at all. Well, she's, she's talking about it in the context of a passage um, of the transformation of the, the French citoyen, so the citizen into the bourgeois, right? So right, right. The, the citizen is in a way de depoliticized into being a mere bourgeois, so a consumer, we might today say, or um, yeah. 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 Um, and and the, the other formulation that I find helpful here is just above, uh, just below that, she says the strange, a, a strange dehumanized kind of humanity emerges there, right? So this is foreshadowing, um, I think, uh, quite clearly her analysis in Origins of Totalitarianism, where she's speaking about the stateless, right? Um, how your mere humanity doesn't grant you um, uh, protection uh, in, in a system that is um, entirely determined by your national belonging. Um, so I think she is speaking about the Jews, but the Jews for her are an example of what happens to many, many more peoples um, in those uh, crucial years of the slaughter, right? So uh, um, the, the Jews are perhaps um, singular for her in the sense that she attests them with a sort of political inactivity um, that precedes that chapter of European history, but, um, but they are not exceptional in the sense that they, they suffer the same fate that other people will suffer if they rely entirely on constructs like human rights or, or, or mm -hmm. put their faith in humanity, right? Yeah, uh, I think um, it's, it's possible that she's referring to the uh, uh, the French and their involvement in the uh, economic exploitation of uh, Africa, and uh, the the the, uh, uh, the slaughter that she's referring to is the slaughter that took place uh, in 1914, World War One. Hmm. Uh, uh, I could see it more with yeah. the second sen sentence: the institutions that turn into monster monsters devouring nations and countries. Um, I could see that that's maybe a reference in some way to, um, well, bureaucracy foremost, but perhaps also colonial bureaucracies and imperialist mm -hmm. yeah. um, institutions. Um, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, that I'm seeing it with the, the first sentence that you read. Yeah, I, it's interesting to, to read uh, uh, before being led to the slaughter, turned into mere beasts. Uh, 
the uh, most recent issue of the New York Review, Review of Books has a uh, excellent review of two books by uh, Adam Hochschild. And uh, uh, in that, he, one of the books that he reviews is the uh, uh, French uh, uh, in the uh, uh, end of the 19th century, uh, over the course of 20 years, building a railroad uh, in, in a French possession and the uh, uh, estimate of the number of deaths that the, uh, uh, that the French brought about in that particular climate, malaria and, and, and others, is somewhere uh, in 20, 30,000 uh, deaths. Uh, and uh, uh, the French uh, uh, approached that, uh, uh, that effort. Uh, they were trying to uh, do what the Belgians had done on the other side of the river, but the, uh, uh, the, the French uh, approached that effort uh, without any regard for the uh, humans that they were exploiting, they were turned into beasts, mm -hmm. and they did. And the French, uh, 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 in turn, were uh, uh, led to the slaughter by their uh, politicians and uh, and generals at the beginning of uh, World War One. So, anyway, mm -hmm. that's that's one I mean, read, but it. I don't yeah. think he's talking about colonialism in any of these essays explicitly. But what is interesting in terms of you mentioning the context of uh, colonialism and post-colonialism is that her call to um, a kind of a kind of consciousness raising uh, for the Jews resonates for me, perhaps because I just read The Wretched of the Earth again, resonates with some of the um, uh, some post-colonial thinkers like Fanon um, in, yeah. in perhaps interesting ways, but that's just a, uh, you know, make of that what you will. Mm -hmm. um, Joanne. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, say that I really liked her discussion of mysticism. I found it really interesting. Um, and her comparison of Christian mystics with with Jewish, with Jewish mystics. Um, Christian mystics, uh, those who become, who have been named saints are not the highest level of saints in the Roman Catholic church. The, the church considers them, I'm speaking as an ex-Catholic by the way. Um, the church considers them one of the lowest types of saints. So they're, they're there's, I guess, a skepticism about about them, um, maybe because of what she points out, this autobiographical element. You know, it's it's always uh, an individual who is having this completely unique experience um, in a church. Very often, sounds to, to many people's mind quite sexual, actually quite erotic. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that, but the, the, the thing that most interested me, and especially what, what you said, Gianna, was that I was reading along thinking Jewish mysticism allowed political action. But then by the end of the essay, she says it, it was a catastrophe. Um, and that last, um, mm -hmm. that last page, uh, page 311, of all mystical trends of the past, Jewish mysticism seems unique in its exclusive concern with reality and action. Hence, Jewish mysticism alone was able to bring a, about a great political movement and to translate itself directly into real popular action. The catastrophe of this victory of mystical thought was greater for the Jewish people than all other persecutions have been. And, and that, that's where that's where I get lost. Is she saying, given the current situation, which would be, uh, let's see, what year was this? 48, um, that, that, you know, looking back on this, that this failure was, was a terrible failure. But I'm, I'm not sure where it becomes, a, why it became a failure. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any yeah, it's super interesting, right? Uh, it's, yeah. it's like a very dialectical understanding of what happens here. The, uh, on the page prior to that, she says, um, in the long struggle between Jewish orthodoxy and Jewish mysticism, the latter seems to have won the last battle. 
This victory is all the more surprising because it was won through defeat, right? Um, so there's a kind of way by which um, the by winning over orthodoxy, the radical element in mysticism is neutralized. Uh, so it, it, it both wins and loses. Okay. Okay. If other people have more to say about that, um, yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> Jump in. Uh, could Yana, I'm sorry. Could you just go over that again, what you said about that part? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, um, so she speaks here about the neutralization of the messianic element on page 310 at the top. Um, and I, th I think what she means is, uh, and, and she says so in, uh, she says in the brackets, the that is the neutralization of political attitudes. So what survives of mysticism is, um, uh, the a certain type of uh, Kabbalism, perhaps, uh, sort of like um, esoteric strands, and um, uh, Hasidism, importantly, right? But Hasidism is, uh, is a mysticism deprived of its political element. So while mysticism, sort of like officially on paper, wins over orthodoxy, it loses in terms of that victory almost kind of requiring the shedding of its political force. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Well, it, well, it does if you think of uh, Hasidism as a kind of a cult, yes. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, I mean, I do. Do you think she did? Um, um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, she says something she says about something Hasidism, about Hasidism, Hasidism right? right? But not a lot. Not I, yeah, I, I cult in the sense that it's uh, it's entirely kind of world alienated, right? Uh, anti political in um, in every yes, way. World alienated is a very good way of putting it. Yes, which would in German be uh, um, distanced from the world, right? Alienate. What would it be in German? Yeah, in Fremdung, Welt in Fremdung. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, uh, Bela? Uh, I found very much, as usual, parallels with the uh, current situation, current political cultural crisis in Russia. Can you hear me? You're a little, the volume is a little low, but yeah. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Um, okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, mostly important for me uh, is her dichotomy style of thinking. You know, uh, she always uh, thinking uh, in a balance between uh, very different, sometimes surprising. Uh, su su it surprised surprised me because, uh, for example, in um, uh, pages from uh, uh, 320, 325, she's speak she's speaking about theatrical culture is um i don't know how to say in english um um as a sound uh, or or as a phone uh, as a um, um screen of political culture it's very interesting because today it's uh, echoes in our situation but today uh, we are speaking about political language as a game language. Uh, there are some parallels here. So, um, and uh, it's interesting. Um, another thing uh, which uh, uh, was very um, uh, interesting for me 
is uh, um, her words are uh, in um, about historical perspectives uh, and in, in, in pages uh, from 313 and uh, 13 and 314. She's, uh, well, we can find it. Um, yes, uh, she's speaking about uh, the su su succession of generations may be a natural guarantee for the continuity of history, but it's certainly not a guarantee of progress. She's uh, speaking, uh, continuing her thought about, uh, about um, how political, uh, how um, mentality of Jew people um, uh, inverted, was inverted in their past. Uh, and today, uh, I think you all know about it, that uh, Russian um, propagandists, Russian uh, historic, uh, histor uh, history, want uh, state history want uh, to say the other world that all slavic uh, people are russian uh, so it's not true we all know about it but uh, this narrative is uh uh was was uh, uh one uh but today something changes so we'll see so mm. yeah, better mm. than today <clears throat> thank you thank you um hannah yeah um i appreciated your summations of the various um articles and i read zionism uh, I, I was off off uh, topic in terms of when I read these chapters. So it's been a while since I read the creating a cultural atmosphere. I did want to say that I think her opening, I, I wanted to make several comments about this um, this piece, which I thought probably the worst opening sentence she's ever opened an article with essay with, in the book, in the in this collection of essays, I mean it's so ridiculously um, undefined. You know, culture as we understand it made its appearance rather recently. I mean, and grew out of the secularization of religion. I mean, it, first of all, you just can't use a word like culture, which you know sociologists, even starting before Weber. Uh, define so holistically as the totality of language, culture, you know, culture, sociologists define culture as, I used to edit sociology textbooks, so I just grabbed one of the ones, the language, beliefs, values, norms, behaviors, and even material objects that are passed down from one generation to the next. That is the sociological definition of culture, which of course is embedded in my mind, so that this weird, um, abrupt beginning of this essay uh, with this non-defined. However, I think that philosophically, she is probably reaching to people like Heidegger and even, or, you know, the Greeks or the Romans, because they had, they just defined culture uh, very differently. And I, I was going to ask you if you knew about that. So that's one thing, but it turned me off so much, this sort of like dumping in the middle of, of her thoughts without her, you know, giving us her definition of culture, I didn't like. Um, secondly, I found it interesting since my father is a theologian and he and others like Harvey Cox um, wrote the secular city, um, and which was postmodern theology, 
And it's interesting that she writes on 299, the historian, though hardly ever the theologian, knows that secularization is not the ending of religion. Well, of course, she wrote this in, when was it, 43. So I grew very impatient, and I, I admit that I gave this essay very little real attention um, uh, because I would have just as her editor, and I am an editor, would have sent it back and said, do me a favor and tell us what you mean by culture before you launch into your essay. Um, so, uh, uh, but it seems, it, it does seem uh, that she, is it true that since she wrote it in 47, was she really talking about post-World War II now that the remnant is here in the world, what kind of a quote unquote culture is going to be created? Is that sort of the overall sense you get of it? I mean, she had, you know, is that sort of what her main thrust is? Because of course, there was such a rich Jewish culture. Yes, they talk about bringing back Yiddish and 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 publishing, um, um, you know, uh, with shock and all these um, Yiddish texts and uh, stuff. But of course, there was always a very rich uh, Jewish culture uh, in especially in East, among East, well, among it, culture is just a fact of life. I don't know. I just found the whole thing a strange drop in the middle of her thinking, unclearly defined, but some interesting stuff in it. And I just wondered if you, what, was she, the only, th the only purpose I can see for this is, is that she's going like, now that we're a remnant, what are we going to do with uh, our Judaism aside from the Jewish, the 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 religious practice of it? Is is that on target mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that seems to be a, a big question in the background of this, right? Um, to me, the culture. The way that she thinks about culture is very close to the way that she thinks about the social, right? So um, the the emergence of the social, as she describes it later in the human condition, okay, um, it is is akin to this phenomenon of culture for her. It's um a, a kind of um um. They, they they almost are sort of complementary, right? Like the social emerges as a realm and culture comes with it, so to speak. Um, and I think it's important to, to note that like culture here is um, the, one of the driving forces behind it, she says, is um, the fear of losing. Uh, the fear right. of um, tradition, right? So right. if you've read a her, if you've um, read her essay on tradition, you know that like, as soon as there is fear of losing tradition, tradition is already lost in a way for her. Okay. Right. Right. So culture is not the same as tradition at her, uh, for her at all. It cannot be. It's kind of the, the symptom of the loss of tradition in a sense. I just um, wonder, do do philosophers like have a, I mean, are there, you know, like sociologists have this definition of culture that's so to me rooted in my mind, mm. but, you know, so you're saying as a philosopher, she's looking, it seems like there she's using it more philosophically than obviously sociologically the term. So it's the, the she, she, you're saying it's aligned with the social much more. Um, that that her definition of culture is more of the social, right? That's what you just said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I haven't read uh, on tradition, and I haven't read those. So uh, I guess I've, that's coming ahead for me. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I don't know about um, other philosophers. I mean, I I think that 
in the German context, this whole question of Kultur has the added resonance of like German Kultur is the sort of, is a kind of perversion of the Nazis, right? Like it's uh, of, of earlier nationalists and the Nazis. So it's kind of wielded as this thing that you right. beat people over the head with. Right, um, right. And so, that may also be one other puzzle piece in, in why she says culture is a new phenomenon, right? Because um, certainly the word culture pre-exists the 20th century, right? But she's she's saying that like the way that we perceive culture as a thing now is new in the context of secularization and transformation of religious concepts and the danger of losing tradition but also presumably in the context of the totalitarian uh, utilization of culture, right? To yeah, it's just, culture. to me, it's just, it's just, yeah, and, and I see that. I just think it, it's so hard for me to, to um, switch over from the sociological definition of it. And I, I do wish it, it's more, it's less uh, amorphously defined, uh, loose, you know, that that you have to sort of go around. I don't know, but I, I do appreciate your your insights. Thank you. I don't want to take any more time. Well, I, mean, I don't know. Does she ever define anything? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, she does. She does. I actually underline where I get clear definitions, and I I love it. <laughs> <laughs> right, but usually what she does is she defines something, and then a page later she defines yeah. it again and defines it, it differently. Right? It's true. It's yeah. true. Right. Right. Thank you, um, Monica. Oh, Monica, you have to. Oh, thanks. Sorry about that. No yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking that question. Uh, this is not my question, but I agree. I had a moment of confusion when she spoke of, you know, I was confused about the term culture and how culture, as I understand it, is being lost. And maybe it's more to do with tradition. But yeah, I found that a bit confusing because I feel like there is this uh, sort of rich tradition of, you know, Jewish intellectuals and Jewish thought. And of course, you know, theology and so many things that are everywhere in our society, in our Judeo-Christian society. So it just, that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, that was a good discussion. And I, and I also wanted to circle back to, I also was confused as at the same point that Joanne was confused about in terms of, you know, how the way she phrased that mysticism ultimately became a failure as um, something that could enable a political front or political activism. And um, she referred in that article to the Sabatian revolution, Sabatian um, sort of struggles, which I, I'm not too familiar with, but I guess my question related to mysticism is I really like the way that it was framed as this sort of philosophy or practice for people who don't have access to political power to sort of enable themselves to act into the world and change the world. And um, I found that very fascinating and also, also pause at the end where she said it was ultimately a failure, but um, I, I, I wanted more and, I, and I'm interested if there are more discussions of mysticism as a force for political action and also, you know, you referenced that it didn't necessarily fully die, this mysticism, as a force for political action. And I feel like, you know, I'm interested in knowing how does it continue as something that, you know, I think we have these moments of revolution or change and then ultimately some piece of it remains or some power in that mysticism remains. So. I'm just wondering if anybody knows any context of the Sabatian revolution and how this mysticism continues as a force for political action, because it's so it's so interesting. And I see so many parallels with Jewish mysticism and other sort of inspirational philosophies that would inspire change. So that's mm. my question. I mean, the immediate reference is just Gershom Sholem's book, which which uh has that uncovers that what he calls hidden tradition 
uh, within Jewish mysticism, uh, a hidden tradition that um, that it, that sort of like motions towards political agency. I think in his thesis too. I it's been a while, uh, many many years since I read that book. So if anyone's memory of that of that book's central tenets is is clear, please jump in. Um, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, what she's gesturing towards there with that last sentence and the catastrophe of Svevi being the cradle of a new era. I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone have a clue? Feel free to jump in if you do. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Or not? Oh, well, I just, uh, does Monica know about Sabate V or however you say his name, the the guy who spread uh, the fact that the or the the the, the uh, belief that the Messiah was coming? Monica, do you know about him? No. Oh, well, that's why it's called the Sabatian Revolution or whatever she said. Um, Sabate Zvi is a very, very, very famous uh, Jew who, I guess he was a rabbi, a scholar, and uh, he proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. In fact, I think he kind of thought he was it. And I'm sure there are many more learned scholars on this this site than I am. But he well, he he grabbed he he gained many many followers, and many Jews believed finally that, that the Messiah was coming. And uh, and and then the date came, and it didn't happen. And ultimately, Sabatai V converted to Christianity, uh, which was pretty awful for everybody. And um, it was uh, a, 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 it was a catastrophe uh, in, of belief and of crestfallen disbelief, whatever. So that's what she's talking about. And I'm sure there are other people who could be a lot more uh, whatever about it. Sabatsvi <laughs> was converted to Islam. Islam, you're right. I'm so sorry. Of course, Islam, exactly. Hmm. But that still that still doesn't tell us what the cradle of a new era is, right? Um, I mean, the cradle of a new era sounds perhaps too hope, or I'm interpreting it perhaps as too hopeful. Maybe she's just saying, it's a new chapter, right? Um, um, the Jews were looking for a new chapter with uh, the, the 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 arrival of the Messiah, right? So that that didn't happen. So now they're looking again for, you know, a new beginning. Right. Uh, I mean, I would think that she's somehow motioning there towards um, Palestine in some way, um, yeah. mo modern Palestine. Um, uh, and, and Jewish uh, residency there, um, like she does in several of the other essays, but yeah. Um, I would like to add that I, I, I think that what she means <clears throat> is perhaps that Zionism is a secular uh, messianism. Ah. Um, and um, right. yeah, and um, Raphael, <clears throat> Raphael Patai, in his book, um, which is called Messiah Texts, interprets um, Zionism as a kind of uh, transforming uh, the messianic hopes um, into political actions. I think that that would fit her idea. It fits it perfectly. Yeah, yeah, I mind. yeah. I think this is this is what the spirit of the time was. Um, in a way, uh, it it may undergird uh, somewhat contempt uh, to the to the uh, old. Uh, mysticism uh, which is was also part of the uh, of the spirit of the time but i'm not sure whether she really shared it but the zionist movement uh, i think 
showed some, I think, some contempt towards the um, uh, um, traditional Jewish mysticism. And on, on the part of Jewish mysticism, so like the, the Hasidic movement, of course, um, denied the Zionist movement because Jews were not supposed to take actions uh, to to liberate themselves, they were supposed to wait uh, for the Messiah. Mm. And Zionism took took over um, the initiative uh, and and said, "We're not going to wait for uh, for the Messiah." This mm. is what she. That would be an interesting research project to figure out whether that's actually what what she's what she's drawing lines here between us. So like Zionism as a secular mysticism. Um, I mean, there is the the essays that we've read about her actual interpretation of Zionist politics at the time. She's pretty critical, right? She's um, she's saying that like one of the major points of criticism is that, is that it doesn't represent the interests of Jews. <laughs> Um, but yeah it doesn't represent I, I missed the last part of your sentence it doesn't represent whom the interests of of regular jews of of the majority of jews that's sort of her main point of criticism in well, the, well you know you're talking can i say something about i mean you know zionism now of course they have religious zionists they have political zion i mean herzl zionism which was what uh, was political Zionism of a kind. Uh, she, but she was a Zionist who uh, wanted a homeland, but not a nation state. But you know, I think you have to differentiate between cultural Zionists, the homeland, where you could have a culture, you could practice, you could have your cultural uh, life uh, as a people, uh, versus uh, Herzl's strictly. Uh, political Zionism, uh, and then, and and then actually the uh, um, the the, uh, uh, the the there were other political Zionists who uh, anyway. There's about what five or six or seven types of Zionism, uh, so you can't just say Zionism per se. But she was dealing with political Zionism. Uh, but when you talk about that, the you know they didn't believe that the Messiah would come. Well, you've got religious Zionists, you know, who are want to live on the land uh, given to them by God. Blah blah blah. Just making that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Gilbert. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me uh, this time. So uh, the most significant, uh, important for me is the Jewish in the world of yesterday. So my reflection of this is that the Jewish during that time the Jewish people, they were highly favored. That is why they went through hard times. So, for instance, there are three signs which show that you are highly favored. The first sign is rejection. During that time, Jewish people were rejected. The second sign is hated. 
So uh, this second sign tells that people will hate you for nothing because you are highly favored. That sign is misunderstood. Gilbert, the connection is breaking up. We're having a really hard time understanding. Uh, can you hear me now? Mm, not very well. Can you, can you type me? your answer? I mean, your question or your, your comment? Yes, please. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Let me type it. Thank you. Susan, do you want to ask in the meantime, and then we will return back to Gilbert's question? Yeah, sure. That would be great. Um, I wanted to go back to your um, connection between the cultural being perhaps for a red part of the social sphere, um, which makes sense to me. And I, I, I think that's what you had mentioned when you were speaking with Hannah. And that occurred to me as well, which if that's so, it leads me to, leads me to the thought of overall, and I caught this in the essays, I think, but I'm interested in, in everyone's, your impression. Do you, do you think that she, because it's not action oriented in many ways, is she, is she critical of the, of the cultural in the way that, she, at least in the way that she is, we think that she's defining it. Is she critical then of the cultural aspect of it all? Because for her, right, the social is not political. So somehow to make it relevant or significant, that social has to make its way into the political. And yet in her thinking, in her writing, I'm not sure that she thinks that's even possible or desirable. Do you have any thoughts on that? And was I clear in what I'm kind of trying to unravel? Wait, can you say that part again, bringing the social into the cultural or the other? Uh, no, the, bringing the social into the political, bringing the social into the public in other words, right? Um, because for her, the social is not, the social is, you know, the social is the household, right? The social, these things that are not that are not political because they're not action oriented. They stay in the home, they stay in the social sphere. So if the cultural in her mind is part of this social sphere, is she dismissing it in some way? If it can't make that leap or that extension from the social into political, many times it seems to me in her other work and her other statements, she's saying, and, and you can think about this in terms of the other, other other movements in our history, right? All the way up till today. So if you define certain movements as being in the social because they're for her personal perhaps, where does that leave culture? Where does that leave mm. art? Where does that leave culture? I mean, is that not part of her world building? And I, I got a lot of questions in there, but, but the more I talk about it, the more I'm a little wondering what she is saying perhaps. Mm. Yeah, that's a super interesting question. I mean, you know, I think um, I, I introduced this concept of the social into an essay that doesn't talk about the social, right? So maybe that's okay. just confusing matters. Um, I think it may be more helpful if we think of culture um, as a, in some way, you know, um, closer to the way that the artwork is discussed in the human condition. Yeah. So um, as something that is, uh, th that, that can be, uh, that, cr that can create worldliness, but doesn't, um, um, is sort of like still aligned very much with the realm of, um, of production. So in, in a way it's sort of like, the means aren't worldly, but the result can be, right? 
Um, so I'm, I'm thinking of the way that she talks about the cultural atmosphere here. That that notion seems to suggest that um, if you have a cultural atmosphere, then you have, um, uh, she says, um, a Jewish culture, right? So you have a kind of like fertile soil for artists and thinkers to draw on a tradition. Um, yeah. And in that way, it does create, um, I, I would think that it creates something like worldness, right? Or um, uh, a, a sense of world, of having a world. Um, but if it, if it lacks that connection, then there, then there's a problem, right? Anyone else want to jump in on that? She's defining culture. We have to pay real close attention to that first sentence, I think. She's defining culture as we understand it today. She's not redefining culture for eternity or for tomorrow or for yesterday. It's as we understand it today. So this essay is concerned with creating a cultural atmosphere in that moment and specifically with two things that, that tradition and religion are not defining culture the way we understand it today. And I think that's still true. If religion still defined culture, she wouldn't have written this essay because the main question seems to be, how do we as Jews claim culture? If, if Judaism naturally was part of culture, if it, was, if it was religiously based as it was in the past, there's no need for this essay. But because it's not part of it and, and we don't have tradition to guide culture, she's raising the question like, what are we creating and how are we claiming it? And how do we participate in, participate in it as Jews? And you know her work that you brought up um, of translating what was considered folklore seems like a part of that, that she's claiming um, Jewish culture because it's this amorphous thing like we're talking about and it's, and it's our job to create it. And it's not something that is based in tradition or religion mm. Mm -hmm. maybe it's the, maybe it's the secularization right because again it's this break with tradition yeah ken is that kind of what you're yeah, yeah you're, i think she has, you're she says, talking around mm -hmm. yeah, that once we accept that it's a secular thing then we can mm -hmm. bring religion into it but even as jews we have to accept that it's a secular culture is a secular thing in this day and age and if we want to bring judaism in it we have to do it actively we have to we have to consider it and pay attention to it and bring it in actively. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, thanks for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great discussion. Thank you. Um, is, do we have a question from Gilbert in the chat? Not yet. Gilbert, if you want to ask a question in the chat, um, feel free, we will definitely return to you. Um, Victus? Uh, yes, I think um, I agree a bit with what Tan uh, said about this, um, to bring religion in as a part of, of the culture. If you have a Jewish culture, I think that's what she's into. You, Because as Jews, you have a long history and Judaism is part of it, but you don't bring the religion in when she says that when you completely cut that off and all those who look at themselves as, as cultural persons, they, they deny their being Jewish. But if you bring it in, it's just like me living in a very secure society, but it's very influenced by Protestantic ethics or so things from Protestantism. So, so the religious aspect kind of gets part of your history. And I also think, I saw this with when she says disgrace and honor are political concepts, categories of public life in that essay on Stefan Schweig. There is, in my view, two parts of this. It's um, he is looking for fame and the fame as a literati, and that is a fame as a person, him as an individual to shine uh, and especially when she says that he, uh, despite his connoisseurship 
on page 324, this knowledge could not prevent him from simply ignoring the greatest poets, poets of the post-war period, Franz Kafka and Bertolt Brecht, neither of whom were ever great successes. And that is to, to in a way, if you create a culture, you create a culture, you find those uh, memories from the past, those things that sticks out and make immortality. And that could create a great culture and make a world for you to live in. And you have to create this, where do you find these things that could create a culture, a world oriented, oriented culture for the Jews? So, so I see in a way, those who do in a way what we talk, often call culture, like the literati as, as she writes about these people, but when they have their individual fame is what they're concerned about, shining out among the elites in a way, that's not what could create a world for eternity, that can't create the immortality that the culture for a people would make. So, so that was a bit my comment. And I have just one other comment that is about um, this mysticism, but this is um, Jewish mysticism I know absolutely nothing about. But coming from that, uh, what stood out to me is what she said on, says on page 306. Uh, and it's about this, um, uh, uh, emanation or forming all modern doctrines asserting that man is but part of matter subjects to physical laws and without freedom of action confront us with the old original agnostic belief in emanation and whether the substance of which man is held to be a part is material or divine has little importance what matter is that man is no longer an independent entity and and in himself and to her so concerned with uh, uh, the public sphere and the um, uh, people as individual with their individual or pl plurality as she calls it, that would be a catastrophe because that would eliminate the, the plurality of human beings. So that was just my take on that. I don't know what you think about that. Just my take as not, don't know anything about Jewish mysticism, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, about your second point, uh, your first point, um, it sort of, um, it sort of uh, connects to the question I had, why she's interested in these kind of mar marginalized figures, right? Um, uh, because, and, and perhaps um, it, it's because um, people like Kafka and Brecht who were not, and nearly as famous as the people with the big editions um, in their time, um, and like Rahel, um, are um, sort of like uh, give us a, a window into the possibility that that what she calls being outside of the law could be an honor, right? Um, so that there is some kind of um, uh, cultural potential in marginalized figures that the kind of um, superstars of cultural production don't don't have. Yeah. Ken, did you want to say more? Yes, but can I wait? Can can I pass to Anne for a minute? I'm sort of formulating what I wanted to say. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, like others, I was very fascinated by this completely unusual definition of culture. I'm much more used to the more anthropological culture is ordinary, culture is something that we all have. Um, it is, and every, every single human society on earth has so to come up with this very unusual idea of culture as coming out of secularization struck me as being very, very powerful, actually. And I was wondering about the implications also of the idea of 
cultural policy having a role as to create a cultural atmosphere. That again seemed to me to be extremely powerful it, to, to suggest that to support the generative aspect of culture, you need it, infrastructure, you need support, you need something very subtle, which is a kind of goodwill. But it was what sort of confused me or the bit I don't understand is the last paragraph on 301, um, which I'll just read the last two sentences. Um, there is no doubt that whatever may happen to Hebrew literature in the future, Hebrew writers and artists will not need to confine themselves to either folklore, <laughs> folk life or religion in order to remain Jews. There are the first, they are the first Jews who as Jews are free to start from more than a pre-cultural level. And it was the, I didn't understand what that meant. What is a more than a pre-cultural level here? Wondered if you could perhaps explain that. Yeah, I mean- Is that I, a reference to mysticism that comes later or something else? No, I mean, she, she's quite clearly saying that um, the, the Jews lack a culture. Right, uh, and, and that's because of this split between um, the between Judaism and the individual outstanding Jewish artist, right? Like so that the individual artist isn't embedded in that tradition. Um, instead, you have this, the two kind of running parallel, um, and uh, so. To me, this this seemed to speak um, uh, to the beginning of the page where the paragraph um, uh, also on 301, where she says, the lack of Jewish culture and the prevalence of folklore and secular Jewish life has denied this transcendence to Jewish talent that did not simply desert the Jewish community. So there's no nourishment for the exceptional artist in in Jewish culture, according to her analysis, and that's why she, I think she's calling it pre-cultural. So, is that in your understanding? Is that what she means by creating a cultural atmosphere? That it's necessary to have this much wider support system, consciousness, in order for that work to really exist. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gilbert got back to us. Um, I'm just going to read it out. Um, what I meant was that there are three signs shown that Jewish people were highly favored. First sign shows that you are highly favored is rejection, which means that people reject you for nothing. Second sign shows that you are highly favored is hate, which means that people hate for nothing and apply a kind of jealousy towards you. That is why the Jewish people went through hard times. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say very much about, um, Theology, um, if 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 you're using the term the the concept of being favored in a theological sense, I really can't comment on that. Um, if anyone else wants to jump in about that, um, feel free. Well, maybe he's talking about the doctrine of the chosen people. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I I, I don't know either. Um, Pen, did you still want to jump in there? there? There is no doctrine of uh, chosen people. Um, actually, the, not doctrine, but that there was the <laughs> the chosen people. Certainly, in Judaism, is uh, central the covenant, the covenant of the chosen people. Is well, exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. Trust me. I think that if you read at least the way I read it, 
There is the covenant of the chosen people. It is not a, a debatable issue. It is a fact. It is very in the religion. It's very debatable. No, no. In the religion, in, in Judaism, there is the covenant of the chosen people. It's not a debate. It's part well, of the religion. Where do, you, where do you base that on? Oh, it's it's like saying, uh, you know, uh, Jesus is the son of God. I mean, in Christianity, the covenant of the chosen people is part of the religion. Okay. Uh, no, not exactly. Okay. I, I don't know how um, productive say, of a discussion it is if, if it's if not it's relevant. Not I'm just yes or no. Um, I it, think it's a, it's a very essential to understand, I think. When you read, especially when you read it in Hebrew, when they said atab khatanu, it is God chose us to receive the covenant. Doesn't mean that the Jewish people are a chosen superior kind of people, but they were chosen to receive and oblige by the covenant. And it is more than a more of a duty. Oh, I'm not disputing any of that. I'm just saying that the covenant of the chosen that that it exists exactly what you're saying. That's yeah, all I'm but, saying. You you interpret chosen in a way that makes no no I you know I have you have no idea of how I interpret chosenness and it's not a discussion I want to get into, uh, but I'm just saying it's part of the tradition. That 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 there is a, a do, there there is a question of chosenness in Judaism between God and and His people. Well, uh, I would like to see. Uh, I mean, that's just like saying, you know, there's a sun and there's a moon. No, uh, what, what you no. feel about it is very different. How you'd interpret it is totally different. I'm not going to get into a discussion I, how I feel you, about you it. Present, you present something as self-evident truth. And I don't accept it. Oh no, you're just not understanding what I'm saying. It's okay. I totally agree with what you said. I, I think I think what the two of you seem to be discussing is whether chosenness implies a privileged position, right? No, and that is certainly I'm not getting into that at all. It's just, it's just the idea of chosenness. Yeah. The idea of chosenness exists in Judaism. Whatever you think of it is not something I'm getting into. I'm just that's all. Well, you haven't shown me that. I, I'm not trying to show you anything. I'm just saying that there's an idea of chosenness. I'm not making value statements about it. Well, I want to see where it is really, where there's a... Okay. Uh, can we can we move on? Um, did Ken, did about... you want to return to your point? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm sort of getting lost, but maybe um, Gilbert was <laughs> pointing to exceptionalism. And you know, I... one of the... One of the themes in, in I think, all these chapters has to do with how we relate to exceptionalism, whether we take the exception as being the famous person um, and as, as being a positive thing. Um, for her, it seems like a very negative thing and a very dangerous thing politically to take ourselves out as exceptions. Um, mm -hmm. And she looks on Wilhelm von Humboldt very favorably when he says, I love the Jews really only in mass and detail, I strictly avoid him. Even though he had Jewish friends, he, he's really advocating for the Jews as a people and saying that on the social or personal, there's a lot of people he doesn't like. And, and I think that Hannah Arendt is totally cool with that. And to take the opposite approach and say that he has to like us individually um, is actually very dangerous. And that's what led to um just the downfall of the jewish people and i think maybe gilbert was pointing to that also that when we allow ourselves to be exceptions or you know to stand out as the famous one or whatever it's actually very dangerous if we're not standing up and saying we're part of a bigger people mm -hmm. yeah thanks that's super helpful also as a way of negotiating that discussion, I think, of, of, of the concept of chosenness. Vigdis, do you want the last word? Okay, I'll just point to something that I found very relevant for our, our time, and that's the uh, 
a second last sentence she says in the Schweig essay. She says, for honor will be won by the cult of, will never, for honor never will be won by the cult of success or fame, by cultivation of one's own self, nor even by personal dignity. And when she also says on page 322, starts the last paragraph with, although deification of the great man without much consideration for what he actually achieved was a general disease of the era. I think that is a huge disease for the era we live in. Absolutely, More, even, yeah, I think it's one of the greatest uh, <laughs> diseases we can see. And just, uh, yeah, you can see politicians, many places. You can see what happens with the so-called influencers. And yeah, it's so much me, me, me. And to, be, to get fame from just showing off yourself, not considerations of the people in any kind of people, I think. That was just then, yeah, my last comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think then the question for a sort of her writing project, um, her philosophical que uh, question, her philosophical project is, how do you write in a way that isn't about you? Like that, that isn't um, presuming to represent a non-existing people out there as an abstraction, but is also not a kind of great man writing, right? And I think that's, I mean, maybe that's also part why her definitions are so mobile, right? Because she's not presuming to give us something that we can take to the grave, right? Um, she's she's inviting us to to think with formations that are fluid and flexible, and and that um, that take account in some way of of plurality. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the discussion today. Uh, uh, we will see you. Uh, next time, next Friday with Roger.